Okay, hello everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I posted slides on. Hold on. I posted slides on the uh, dev channel on the Slack, Bitcoin Edge, Slack.com. Um, so I posted two sets of slides. I'm going to go through Lightning Network and then I guess discrete log contracts. And I hopefully we'll have time. I think we'll have time. And we can do sort of an interactive thing uh, where everyone downloads the software I'm sort of working on and tries it out and sees if it works and makes payment channels with each other and stuff on a uh, test network. Um, and so it's uh, I'm so it's running on a little computer here, and hopefully that will be able to serve the blockchain to everyone in the room and like connect things. So that'd be fun. Um, but anyway, well, I'll just start with the talks. Um, I was sort of looking at the other talks, and so I hopefully have approximately the right uh, level of, you know, technical sophistication for everyone. Um, but this is, you know, complicated stuff. If there's things you don't understand, please raise your hand or don't even raise your hand. Just ask. Um, I think there's a lot of time. Like, it's two and a half hours, which is kind of way too long. So we'll definitely take some breaks, probably one after this set of slides, and then... I mean, you know, there's there's tons of time. Um, so I think I have a ton of material too, but um, we might not get to everything, but definitely ask questions. Uh, we'll have discussions and stuff like that. Okay, so I'll just start with the first one, the Lightning Network, which is like kind of old at this point, but yeah. Um, this was a paper I wrote with uh, Joseph Poon like two something years ago, and there's a bunch of people working on software for it. It's pretty cool. Okay, so... The main idea here is uh, how can we scale the blockchain, which is one of the you know old problems with Bitcoin. Uh, we want to allow like millions and millions of people to use this, maybe billions. Probably, probably this doesn't get you to billions, but it helps. Um, but we need to preserve the important properties of this system, right? Everyone needs to be able to verify things. Uh, we we don't want to introduce any kind of trust into the system. So here's the scalability problem in brief. Uh, every node verifies every message. This is not a good system. Uh, so the equivalent is like if there's only one email inbox in the whole world and you're sharing it with everyone else and you see everyone else's emails, um, that wouldn't work. Or the whole world is on a single Wi-Fi access point. Uh, you could send messages that way. That would be kind of an interesting way to do it. But um, as you can imagine, it would be very congested. Uh, and this is an important property of Bitcoin, right? Everyone needs to agree on who's got what money, um, but it's very costly to maintain. So uh, the first and easiest method for scaling is sort of brute force scaling. OK, well, crank up the message rate. The, the global message rate increases. More people can use it. There's more transactions. Sure. Um, you can get a 2x, 4x, you know, linear kind of speed up. Um, it's somewhat like going from 802.11g to n to ac for your single planetary Wi-Fi access point. Um, it certainly is you know, helpful, but it, it doesn't get, where, get you to where you need to go. Um, so really, what you have to do is something like the internet, where you split things up. And there's different you know, trunk lines and cables under the ocean and stuff like that. Um, and when you're sending a packet to another server, uh, not every server in the world sees it. Just a few do. But how do you do that in Bitcoin and maintain consensus? Right? If everyone's got a different view of who's got what money, it doesn't really work. Um, but if you could, you could enable a lot of cool applications like micropayments, things like that. OK, so cut to the chase. The, the way we do this, the way the, what Lightning Network is built on, is called payment channels. And the idea of a payment channel is two participants, Alice and Bob, uh, they send money into a funding, they send money to a shared address. And this address is uh, two of two multisig. So Alice and Bob both need to sign to spend from it. Um, and then once they've got this sort of money in this shared multisig address, they can create transactions that spend from that address and hand each other partially signed transactions. So in the first case, they say, okay, Alice sends 10 coins to this transaction output. And then after, after this transaction output exists, we say, okay, Alice gets one of the coins and Bob gets nine of the coins. Um, and Alice constructs this transaction signs it, and sends the signature to Bob. And Bob does the reverse. Bob also constructs a similar transaction, signs it, sends it to Alice. So now both of them have these half-signed transactions. 
um, that they can sign the other half anytime they want. Uh, there's no point in storing your own signature, right? Because you have your private keys, you can just sign whenever you want. So, but there is a, a big point in storing someone else's signature. So Alice stores Bob's signature, Bob stores Alice's signature. And then whenever either of them want to, they can broadcast. Okay, and then they don't though. What they do instead is uh, they exchange new signatures. So Alice will say, okay, uh, now the new, the new transaction we're gonna agree on is you have four and a, uh, sorry, I have four, you have six. And they both send signatures for that transaction. And then they can say, okay, the next state is Alice has two, Bob has eight. Um, and you can do this back and forth as many times as you want. Um, okay, so I will go in, this is a little bit of a summary. I'll go into more depth of how exactly these things work and what the messages are. I'll go into like a lot of gory details uh, later. But uh, the first simplest part, okay, this is sort of the, the basic idea of a payment channel. Have a single output. Um, and then you keep trying to spend it with different transactions. And of course in Bitcoin, these are all basically double spends, right? Only one of these can ever get confirmed into a block um, because they're spending the same uh, transaction output. Okay, that's cool. But, uh, and, and actually that's really cool. You can have two participants, they can see, keep sending back and forth. Um, it's sort of like opening an account. And I think it's very applicable to things like exchanges, stuff like that, where you have some kind of relationship with another party and you're sending money back and forth. Um, but sometimes opening account is not really useful. Like if I want to buy a hot dog at a stand, I don't really want to open an account at the hot dog stand and then, you know, have a balance with them and things like that. That doesn't work. Um, so sometimes you want one-off payments and you want more, that enables more scalability as well. Um, so you could make a network of channels. Um, so the idea of multi-hop channels is, you know, Alice has a channel with Bob. Bob has a channel with Carol. Carol has a channel with Dave. And this is a very limited subset. Probably every node will have a whole bunch of channels with a whole bunch of different nodes. Um, but I'm just looking at this, you know, section of the ne network graph. Um, Alice wants to send money to Dave. Alice could open a channel with Dave and send it that way. Or Alice could, of course, just use regular uh, on-chain Bitcoin transactions. But if you've got a path, Alice can do it without sending, uh, without sending any data to the actual Bitcoin network. So basically this is optimizing for, you know, don't use the Bitcoin blockchain uh, because there's fees associated with that. Instead, send it to Bob, who sends it to Carol, who sends it to Dave. But do it in a way that's trustless, right? You could say, you know, trust people and say, okay, Bob, I'm gonna send you a, go a coin and please send it to Carol. And Carol, please send it to Dave. And they could all do that and it would work, but there's a lot of trust involved in that um, Bob can just receive the coin from Alice and keep it, and that's no fun. Uh, and then you could say, well, we can, we can, you know, since there's no on-chain transaction fees here, we can start to minimize each uh, state update. We could say, okay, Alice wants to send a coin to Dave. First, she sends a hundredth of a coin to Bob, who hopefully will forward it to Dave. So that the worst she, you know, worst she's out is a hundredth of a coin. Uh, and then you can do this a hundred times and, you know, try, minimize the trust that way. Um, that would sort of work. And, and there's some elements of that in some of the software, but the better trustless way is this. Okay, so first, Dave comes up with a random number, which is like 20 bytes or 32 bytes or whatever. You know, just de cat, dev, you random, come up with a random R, uh, and then take the hash of it with SHA-2v6 or whatever. And then send that hash, we'll call that H, to Alice. So Alice and Dave are not connected on this channel network, but they do have a regular old TCP IP connection between each other, which is authenticated and encrypted. Um, so they can talk, everyone can talk, assume everyone can talk to everyone else. They just don't have uh, payment channels open. Okay, so Alice says, hey Dave, I wanna send you a coin. And Dave says, great, I like Bitcoins. I want more of them, send me one. And Alice says, okay, but give me H. And Dave does, Dave creates R, sends Alice H. Then um, Alice pays Bob a coin. So it's a little, different than a normal payment in that it's like in the channels where we saw they update a new transaction. And this new transaction, Bob's got one coin more than he did before, right? Alice's balance decreases by one, Bob's increases by one. However, it's not two, uh, there's not two transaction outputs, there's actually three. And the third one is potentially Bob's or potentially Alice's. Um, the, it's spendable by Bob if Bob knows the pre-image of H. So there's some opcodes where it's like, okay, Bob needs to sign, but also Bob needs to post a value 
basically are. I mean, there's probably other pre-images, but Bob needs to find something where it's pre-image of H and also sign. Or after a day, Alice can take the money. So there's some timing issues there where, okay, well, this, this coin is Bob's, if he knows R, or Alice's tomorrow. So Bob receives this and says, okay, cool. This is money that I could spend if I knew what R was, but Bob does not know what R was. Bob then forwards it to Carol. So Alice also tells him, hey, this is going to Dave. So, well, no, sorry. Alice tells Bob that it's going to Carol. Bob does not know that Dave is involved at all. Uh, Bob and Carol only see the nodes adjacent to themselves. So Carol does not know that Alice exists in this process. Um, Bob forwards it to Carol and says, hey, Carol, um, I'll, you know, here's this new output in our transaction where if you know R, you know, if you know the pre-image of H, you can take a coin. Uh, and Carol's like, that's great. Where do I send this? Send it to Dave. Uh, Carol then, out, you know, pays Dave. Sorry. Dave does not. That's Alice's responsibility. Dave sort of doesn't care how it gets to him. Um, Al, it's Alice's job to find, you know, to. Yep. Yeah. So if you so the easiest way is if you just have the full graph, you do like Jaxer's algorithm or whatever, and you say, okay, well, this seems like the shortest path to Dave. Um, and Dave doesn't have to know the path. Dave just sees that Carol sent him this, you know, payment contingent on R. Um, Alice does have to know the hell path because she sort of um, onion encrypts it. So she encrypts a message to Bob, which when Bob decrypts it, has, you know, says, hey, send this to Carol. Send this message to Carol, who the then Carol can decrypt, send it to Dave. Car Dave. So, you know, everyone sees the, the person before them in order to get the message and the next person in the link uh, to send the message to and like has some encrypted data for them. Um, but yeah, so Al Alice sort of knows the routing. Um, and routing, there's other, there's some other algorithms for routing where you might not need the entire graph. Um, I think in the case of Bitcoin, it's sort of okay to have the whole graph on your computer because every channel is a UTXO. And if you're running a full node, you already have the entire UTXO set. So it's sort of similar, it's gonna be similar in size um, to the UTXO set. So it never really gets an unfeasible because if it were unfeasible, then Bitcoin itself would be unfeasible to run. Um, okay, so yeah, so Carol, the final step, well, the final step in this process is Carol uh, creates the same output spending to Dave if Dave knows R. And Dave does know R because he made it up himself and says, great, I'm, you know, this is my money. Uh, he could now at this point broadcast, you know, close the channel, broadcast that transaction, immediately, you know, take the money by revealing R. Um, but that would close the channel. And so Dave does not want to do that. He could, you know, and that, uh, that may happen if say Carol does this and then before he's able to respond, Carol goes offline or, you know, something happens or Dave loses his internet connection and never connects back and has to broadcast it or something. Um, but since you want to keep the channel open to keep this, these fees low, instead what Dave does is Dave just tells Carol what R is. Uh, and then Carol says, okay, well, this contingent payment where you get the coin if you know R and I get the coin a day later if you don't, well, clearly that's no longer contingent, right? You just showed me what R is, so I know you know it. Um, and then Carol can go back to Bob and do the same thing and say, hey, Bob, look, this is my money, right? This, this payment you've got to me, I know what R is. Here, I'll show you. Um, and so, you know, it's mine now. And then Bob then uh, gives it to Alice. Alice finally gets R and Alice says, okay, I know that Dave got his money. That's sort of a receipt, like a confirmation that the payment has been successful. Um, and then once Alice gets R, well, sorry, it actually happens throughout the process, but um, you can get rid of the, wait, sorry, so contingent payments, can, yeah, so all the contingent payments can be removed because everyone knows, well, everyone knows that everyone else knows what R is. So all these sort of conditional payments, well, they're going to happen. Uh, so we can just update our channel state to not require this R value at all and instead just say, okay, you've got an extra coin. Um, there's essentially no difference from everyone's perspective because they're aware. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so timing is important. If Alice waits a day um, before clearing this, this out, she could potentially 
uh, grab the money back. And Bob will not allow that. So Bob, you know, if, if you've got this contingent payment, right, Bob hasn't cleared it out yet, um, and it's getting close timing-wise, Bob's like, all right, I'm closing this channel, right? Because I'm already on the hook. I've already sent the money to Carol, and if I haven't really gotten the money from Alice in, like, free and clear, I'm going to close this channel and then, rev you know, put R on the blockchain and take it. Um, so Bob doesn't want it. Like, no one really wants to do that, but they will. And the software will automatically do that if the timing gets tight. Uh, so this whole process should take, you know, a second or two. Uh, and if it takes minutes or hours, then p channels start closing really within like 30 seconds to a minute. Like the software will be like, okay, someone's offline. Uh, this, I, I have some risk here. I'm going to close the channel, uh, and, and, you know, reveal R or not, depending on how it works. Um, so yeah, so this way you can clear out R, so you don't have to keep track of all these things. Um, and the channel can, you know, a single channel can be used for like a whole bunch of different payments over time. You can also have multiple different, these are called hash time lock contracts, HTLCs. You can have multiple different contingent payments within a single channel simultaneously. Um, I don't know how in practice how useful that'll be, but you could have, you know, I'm send, spending to Carol as well as Dave with two different R's. Yeah. No, no, Dave reveals R to Carol. That's say if he does, like, Ah, okay, so if Dave gets this thing and doesn't reveal R, then Carol's like, hey, Dave, what's going on? Like, I thought this is for you. Um, the thing is, Carol doesn't necessarily know that Dave's the end recipient, right? Carol, Carol might think that Dave's forwarding on to someone else. So either of those could be possible. But Carol does say, look, Dave, it's been, you know, a minute, and you haven't told me R, so, like, let's just get, you know, either we can cancel this entire process, so if, let's say Carol can't connect to Dave at all, right? Carol gets the message from Bob. He's like, okay, cool, I'll send it to Dave. Dave's unresponsive. Then you can actually turn this back um, because Carol says, okay, I haven't, I'm sort of not on the hook. I don't have like a potential debt or, you know, like a potential liability here. So I've just got this potential gain if I know R. And it doesn't seem like I'm going to learn R because Dave's not online. So this whole thing's not working. So I can go back to Bob and say, hey, Bob, let's, let's clear this out. Let's cancel it because I can't get a path. And then Bob can say, okay, and they you know, just make a new state in the channel without this contingent payment back to the state they were at. Um, and then Bob can go back to Alice and say, hey, it didn't work. You know, we got to Carol, and Carol couldn't get further. Um, so, you know, or Bob doesn't even say, need to say Carol. Bob's just like, I, you know, it, I'm, I, it came back. And then Alice can say, okay, it didn't work, and connect to Dave or say, okay, there's a path failure. Okay, wait, so, okay, the first one is, wait, first one is Bob is offline, or? Yeah, Carol, Carol says, I haven't heard from Dave, let's close it out with Bob, so then Bob. Then Bob's offline? Yeah. All right, well, then Carol has to close the channel with Bob, since Bob's offline and they have a contingent payment. Although, really, Carol, no, Carol's fine, right? Worst thing that can happen is somehow she learns R and gets more money, right? That, that extra coin wasn't hers for any legit reason. Uh, she was just supposed to forward it. She never did. So Carol has zero risk there. She's like, okay, well, maybe someday if I learn R and Bob's still offline, I'll just broadcast and take the money. If not, I'll just either leave it or close it. Um, if Bob stays offline for hours or days, Carol just broadcast, you know, closes the channel by broadcasting the state and doesn't get the money. The money, you know, she never learns what R is. And if Bob's offline forever, that money's just stuck because Bob can get it back, but he's gone. Um, so, so Carol has no real risk here. Um, wait, the other thing was, uh, wait, sorry, what was this? If you, if you, um, someone's unresponsive, you close the channel. Mm -hmm. Ah, timing there. Yeah, so that is, that can be a risk if the timing is, so, okay, if you broadcast, but it's still in the mempool, the clock doesn't start ticking until uh, it's con confirmed in a block, right? All the time locks are based on, uh, like no one, I don't think any, you could do Unix time for the relative and absolute blocks, but everything's placed on block height. Um, and these are, um, these are actually absolute time. There's, there's two different types of time locks that are used. Relative time locks, relative to when the confirmation has been confirmed, 
and absolute time locks based on a, you know, an absolute block height. And so generally in these, you'll use um, absolute block height for the expiry of these contingent payments. Um, so the clock's ticking sort of as soon as Alice sends to Bob, Alice sends this contingent payment to Bob. Like, look, you've got a day to, to you know, send this out and clear it out. And if, you know, and really you, you can send it, you can say a day, but it's, and then also Bob to Carol is going to be 20 hours and Carol to Dave is going to be 16 hours or something to give some leeway there. Um, but yeah, once once it's even close, like, hey, it's been an hour, okay, I'm broadcasting this and, and taking it back. Um, so yeah, so the, in, in terms of a congested mempool, the problem with congested mempool is once that gets broadcast, you need to grab it pretty quick, right? Um, not if if you are if you are someone who knows what R is. If R never if R never happened, right? It never got to Dave and it gets broadcast. It's totally safe because R doesn't exist, right? No one knows what it is, um, and so you have you have plenty of time to to grab the money back. Okay, so that's some of the multi-hop fun stuff, which is all crazy and fun. Uh, pat finding paths, like balancing things out. There's all sorts of like asterisks is here in that um, you never want most of like all the money to get on one side of the channel because then you can attack uh, the channel. You can attack by sort of broadcasting a state where you had a lot more money. Basically, there's nothing at stake for Alice if she has zero funds in the channel. So like, why not just try to close it uh, fraudulently? Um, and I'll go into that next, right? Yeah. Um, OK, so you have multi-hop over different channels. And this is. Uh, Wait, where's Ethan? Ethan is yeah yeah. So you're gonna Ethan's gonna talk about this in detail, uh, in geez two hours. Uh, <laughs> so so yeah, maybe this is a bit of a premature uh, you know trailer for that. But uh, yeah, from the software's point of view, it sort of doesn't really matter what blockchain those channels are on, um, since they're all since most of them are are quite similar to Bitcoin in their operation. You could have Alice having a Bitcoin channel to someone. And that's someone having an altcoin channel to Carol and saying, well, I'll send you a Bitcoin if you send this person 20 altcoins. Um, but yeah, you can, you can go into that. Um, anyway, so the basic idea, um, the utility here is that it's kind of cool, right? You're faster, which is, uh, for from the times I've used Bitcoin, it has not mattered. But there are use cases where you really don't want to wait for inclusion in a block. And you want to get confirmation within a second or two. So like in-person retail payments, uh, you know, higher higher frequency kind of things, um, and it's a nice balance in that when people are, ch are chill, the whole thing works a lot cheaper. Um, and when they start fighting, you can go back to the underlying security of the blockchain network. Um, and another sort of analogy is well, everyone makes these contracts, but very few people go to court. So you have like rental agreements and all sorts of things, and you don't actually enforce them mostly. Uh, yeah. Oh no! You put you put fees. So like, um, yep, yep. They've got fees. I mean, you know, the the fun, let's say the fund transaction output is is nine is ten coins. You'll actually have like point nine 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 and point eight point nine nine nine. You know, you'll have you'll have some kind of fee, uh, you know, difference there. And yeah. No, no, because wait. Oh yeah, so you could have you could have lightning fees here where um, Alice sends one coin to Bob and Bob coin Bob sends nine coins to Carol, or I'm sorry, Bob sends 0.9 coins to Carol. You can do that as well, but that that's just sort of Bob's keeping a cut of it. Um, but the the actual fees that goes to miners, um, it sort of doesn't change though with the number of state updates. Um, so here, let's say you know, okay, I'm going to put a 10,000 Satoshi fee or whatever. Uh, with the one nine, but at the next state, you still have the same fee, and the miner never sees any of these transactions. They only see the last one, um, so the fee can be somewhat consistent. It is a little tricky if fees change a lot. So, like, 
And you can do this in the software. You can say, okay, I'm going to change, you know, let's, let's update the fee that we're using. So like at state one, fees are pretty low. State two, fees are pretty low. And then at the time of state three, they're like, hey, look, mempool is really congested. Let's up our fee for our transactions. And they can both agree to do that. Uh, issue there is what if like you make state two like a week ago and then state three you want to make, but they're offline and you want to up the fee, but you can't because your counterparty's offline. Uh, so you may want to like, you may want to even make new states without a different balance just to change the fees. Um, and if your counterparty's offline, you might not be able to. So there's other ways to deal with that, but yeah, that is that is some complexity too. So, yeah. Wait, what do you like? Alice and Bob is just two nodes. Who would be so? Who would be the network provider, Alice or Bob? Um, you can definitely, I mean, it could, you know, Bob can be a, Random on your yeah, I mean, so, so like in the use case, practically, maybe Bob's a merchant and Alice is a customer or Bob's a exchange and Alice is a user of the exchange. Um, but in the software, there's no, there's no distinction or there's no notion of like one, one party is sort of a servery and one party is a clienty kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, in practice, it's similar to Bitcoin, right? Like everything's peer to peer, but in practice, people use big companies and, it's hard to stop that kind of thing. Uh, other, wait, there, oh, yeah. So going back to the fee thing, like say, you know, it's a week later and fees are not yeah. what they were. Like, are these all like just like rehash single outputs and you just add another input to adjust the fee? If you want to say if you were a state or whatever. You can't do SIGHASH single. You can do child face for parent. Um, the whole, okay, the other thing, which I don't even have in the slides, Ideally, none of these transactions ever get to the blockchain. And when the two parties want to close the channel, they just connect to each other and make a totally new transaction with whatever fee they want that doesn't, and, and also can send anywhere they want with any outputs. So like Alice has, you know, Alice has a balance of four, Bob has a balance of six. In, instead, Alice wants to send on chain three coins somewhere. Uh, so Alice says, hey, Bob, I want this to be our output set. One coin to my address, three coins to this other address where I'm buying something. How about you? Where do your six want to go? And Bob's like, yeah, I just want all six to come to my wallet. Um, and then they make a new transaction that has no time locks or anything. Totally they, yeah. Lightning. Well, it, it spends the lightning TX out, right? None of the intermediate yeah, it, it, and it doesn't use any of these things at all. So it looks like a norm. So these do look a little different in that they have different opcodes, uh, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but they, yeah, they make a two, totally new closing transaction that is valid immediately, signed by both of them, and they just broadcast it, and it looks like a normal transaction. Yeah, yeah. Is the time lock not set when that fund is made? Okay, wait. Is the time lock not set when the fund is made? Uh, with the transaction sending to this output? That doesn't have any time locks involved. Uh, these transactions have relative time locks. So the, well, I'll get to the script of these in a second, but, but actually n lock time is not used for any of these transactions. It's op check sequence verify. There's an op check sequence verify opcode in here in one of the, in these output scripts, but this normal, no, no n lock time, these transactions themselves are also normal with no n lock time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so some of these, these transactions going to have like, the, you know, out of box local state of, you know, perhaps it's in what do you think is like would be like good business to be like best practice in terms of data loss and loss? Oh, so that's an interesting. Okay, so I should go through the slides a little before we go into questions because a lot of these things are are hinted on. Um, so yeah, you don't actually have to keep track of all your old states. You can forget about them. Um, however, backing up your data is very dangerous in this system. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let me go through, but but yeah, like if you make a USB backup and then restore it, you may lose all your money, which is different than in normal Bitcoin. I'll go through why here, wait, hold on. Oh, that, I left Japanese in, sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, wait, yeah, I'll just go to here. Okay, uh, this is not a good order if I want to. Okay, I'll do this and then I'll go back and, because there's questions, sorry. Okay, so the idea of the payment channel details, how do you actually enforce this, right? How do you erase the history? So there's two, di you know, there's multiple different states that we've agreed on, um, but we really only want the most recent one to get onto the chain. 
Uh, so it'd be nice if you could delete the old states, but you can't, right? You can't prove, oh, I totally deleted your signature for state two, and I've gotten rid of it. You could if you have something, you know, magical like Intel SGX or something. And you have remote attestation, and then it, then this whole thing becomes trivial cryptographically. Um, but when Alice says, hey, okay, Bob, you've now got eight instead of six. I only have two now instead of four. Um, Bob needs to say, well, wait, how do I know, right? What if you just broadcast state two and, and keep the four? Um, and from the point of view of the network, these all look fine, right? The network has no notion of, oh, well, okay, this, this one's newer or older. I mean, you could, but there's no consensus rule on I've got to like – Keep, and and there, there can't be, right? Because you can always, after the fact, say, oh, no, that was invalid because I've got this newer thing. And, and that's not how Bitcoin works. So from the point of view of the network, all of these are fully signed transactions. Um, and that's it, right? The only thing this output script specifies is give me two signatures. Give me Alice's and Bob's signature, and we're good. Uh, and so all these, they're both signed, so they're all fine. Okay, so what you need to do, actually, is you have a different script which um, these outputs are not just Bob and Alice. These are Alice if she waits 100 blocks or Bob if she knows a secret, or Bob if he knows a secret that Alice generates. Uh, so, when, so they both hold sort of mirror images of each other's transactions. The transaction that Alice holds spends to Alice, but she has to wait 100 blocks. The transaction that Bob holds spends to Bob, but he has to wait 100 blocks. Um, the transaction you hold that has an output for the other person, the other person gets it immediately free and clear, right? So this, so if this is Alice's hard drive, it just sends six to Bob with nothing, with no weird stuff. It's just Bob's pub key hash. But her own, her own portion, the four bitcoins that are like hers, well, in order to spend it, she has to wait. And also, there's another clause where if she, you know, if Bob, there's Bob's key, but also this secret preimage that Alice creates. Um, as long as she doesn't tell Bob what this secret is, it's fine. She just has to wait 100 blocks, right? Um, but if she does tell Bob, hey, here's secret number two, Bob's like, cool, this is now my money, right? Uh, and so, Bob, so that's how Alice can sort of revoke her claim on state number two, right? If Bob knows the secret, Bob's like, great, I'll just immediately grab these four coins, because it says my key and secret number two, and you've told me secret number two, uh, and so I get the six and I get the four, I get all 10. Um, but state three, Alice has not yet revealed what secret number three is to Bob, right? So if Alice does broadcast state three, Bob doesn't know secret three, can't take the coins. Alice has to wait 100 blocks, but then she'll just be able to take the coins. Um, and the reason you have this, this delay of 100 blocks is so that Bob has a chance to grab these coins. Right, Alice has to wait. Bob doesn't. So Bob, and that's that's tricky, right? For Bob, he needs to immediately see that this happened, right? Like Bob's Bob software is aware of state three. Bob software observes state two, and then automatically says, "Nope, this is mine." You know, uses secret two to grab the funds and broadcast this transaction. Um, and Alice has to wait a hundred blocks. Uh, Bob can also put an enormous fee on this transaction. <laughs> Right, Bob's greedy, and so he wants the extra four coins. But really, Bob's only supposed to have uh, eight, not ten. So Bob's totally willing to pay uh, like an entire Bitcoin worth of fees here. If if you know if timing gets tight enough, Bob's like, okay, well, I'm only supposed to have eight here. Uh, you know, I only got six, but there's four up for grabs here. So I'll spend, you know, I'll grab three and have like an entire Bitcoin worth of fees. So the miners are just going to grab that immediately, uh, and I still get an extra coin than what I should have. So the broadcasting in old state can be very costly and dangerous for the attacker. Um, and there's also automatic software where you can, like, even if Bob's offline, he can pre-generate this transaction since he knows secret two and says, well, Alice has not broadcast state two, but if she ever does, I know what I'm going to do. And I'm going to, you know, here's the transaction. I can just sign it. I can give that transaction signed to someone else to broadcast for me if this ever happens. And even more fun, you can do that without telling the third party what channel you are or what you can you can basically do it completely anonymously. So you can have a service where you say, OK, I have a channel. I'm not going to tell you what the channel is, how much money I have, who I am, anything. I'm just going to give you a bunch of these transactions, which I think in the white paper are called like 
penalty transactions, but in the code, I call them like justice transactions. Uh, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, so there's like, you can basically aggregate an entire block of justice transactions and say, look, if any of these TX IDs show up, broadcast the corresponding transaction. Um, but the TX ID is a hash and doesn't tell you anything about, like knowing a TX ID of a transaction that doesn't exist doesn't reveal anything about the transaction itself. And knowing a signature for a transaction you haven't seen also doesn't tell you anything. So it's fully anonymous until it happens. So once it happens, the, the third party will know how much money you had. But if it doesn't, and hopefully never, never will, you have full anonymity. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism for a revocation, uh, which leads to the fact that, okay, if you broadcast an old state, your counterparty takes all the money in the channel. Uh, and old states are essentially radioactive, and you should delete them. Because if you accidentally broadcast state two when you've already signed off on state three, uh, it's all automatic, right? You're like, oh, Dave, or, you know, Bob, sorry, I broadcast the wrong one. Here, I'll totally give you the two coins that I accidentally seem to have tried to grab. It's too late, right? Bob Software immediately broadcasts the justice transaction, taking all the money. Uh, maybe you can go to Bob and be like, hey, sorry, I broadcast the wrong thing. You're supposed to have eight, and I'm supposed to have two. You got all 10. Can you give me the two back? And if Bob's feeling very generous, he might, but probably shouldn't. Um, so yeah, so really you only have to keep track of the most recent state and you can delete all the old stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the idea of third parties to automatically monitor your channels. Uh, you don't need to, right? There's The advantage is, well, what if I've got these like a bunch of channels open with people who are pretty shady and might be trying to steal money from me and I want to go on vacation and I don't have internet and like I don't want to deal with what the power goes out at my house and like you know I can leave my laptop running it's just annoying uh, to have to you know another way to do it is say look I'm going on vacation for a week I'm just going to close all my payment channels that way there's no risk because I'm just on regular Bitcoin um, but it'd be nice to say okay well I have a service where you know it's it's trusted in that I'm trusting them to be online and and run this but I don't have to reveal any information about my payments to them. Well, not in, they get some kind of frequency information and they, like if you put a lot of data to them, they're like, hmm, this person's making a lot of payments or this person's making very few, but they don't see how much money you have or what channels you're monitoring. Um, and then you can say, okay, well, here's some company or some server or even my friend's computer where I just say, hey, I'll automatically you know, send all these things to my friends. And if any of us are online, we're all sort of looking out for each other. Uh, without knowing too much about each other's payments. Um, I think it, it helps the safety. And, it, and in practice, I think these will very rarely be used in that the penalties are so great that like, why would you write software to try to grab old states? Uh, you know that there's all this software defending it and you're just going to lose all your money. So hopefully they don't try to do it. But, um, but having a really good you know, backup plan where there's all these different computers watching the network to enforce this can be helpful. Um, and it, you know, it's a different model than than normal Bitcoin, where in normal Bitcoin you don't have to worry about timing. And once you've got the money, you're all set. So, okay, yeah. No, okay. So there's there's pretty big difference. So okay, this is a little bit of a lie in that uh, the actual opcodes, it's not Bob and a preimage. It's just Bob, um, because what you can do is you can do some fancy math to homomorphically add in two keys so that it's really it's bob's it's bob's signature but it's not bob's pub key it's bob's pub key plus another pub key and alice reveals the secret the pre the the private key for that and then bob can now combine the two private keys to sign for the combined public key um so that saves space and makes the scripts more compact uh you cannot do that in well, you could add, there, there is research, there is maybe a way, but it's crazy. You cannot do that with the R values because an important property of the R value is that if it does get broadcast on the blockchain, you should be able to see what R is, right? And so if, if, if Dave, you know, gets this payment and says, oh, cool, I know what R is, closes the channel, grabs the money, in order to grab the money, that, that R, that 20 bytes or 32 byte R value is going to get into the blockchain. And so then everyone can see it and be like, oh, now we all know what R is. Uh, so it's important in this case that Dave must publicly reveal R to claim the funds. Uh, but that's not the case here. So they can, you know, the fact that Secret 2, you know, it's only Alice and Bob. Secret 2 has no other global meaning. 
And so you can combine them into one key. Yes? Hold on, R in this case or in the here? Uh, so it'll be stored in the, in the signature script, right? The output script will say, okay, you know, check, check sig and then like 20 byte hash, op hash 160, op equal verify. Um, and so in the input, the signature script, or in this, in this case, since it's all using SegWit, the witness script, you'll see that 20 or 32 byte uh, value for R um, when, once the transaction's been you know, grabbed. So that, that's in the blockchain in the witness script. These, these sort of secrets never show up. It just looks like a normal signature. Uh, so you, you can't see them, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah. so, so if there's a chain off and we're in state three and Alice you know, had a hard drive, her, her program crashed mm. and lost our data, how's that going to work? Um, yeah, this is, so this is, um, backups are very bad here, right? Like you get to state three, and you're like, cool, and then you're, you lose your hard drive, and you restore, and you're back at state two. And you don't really remember, and your computer doesn't remember, and you're like, okay, cool, I'll broadcast, I need to close this channel, I'll broadcast state two. Bad idea, you lose all your money. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, don't make backups. Or what you can do is, <laughs> well, okay, so if you remember your private keys, but you actually don't remember what state you're in, it's also very dangerous to ask your counterparty, hey, wait, what state are we in? And then Bob will say, we're in state one. Uh, and you're like, okay, cool, state one. Well, no, if, if you remember that there's a state two and the Bob says, we're in state one, you're like, wait a second. No, we, we're not in state one. I, I know that we're not. But if you don't remember, probably the best strategy is just don't say anything and don't talk to Bob ever again, right? Bob will close the channel out eventually. And he will probably close it out at state three and you're like, I guess I only had two coins. I thought I had four. Okay, well, whatever. You know, clearly, I, I only remember up to two. He broadcasts three. I can't contest that, right? Because he's he's got, you know, he's further along than I am. So he's clearly at least more right than I was. Maybe maybe there was a state four where I had more coins, but I don't remember it, so there's nothing I can do. So, okay, cool, I got my two coins. Um, yeah, because it's very risky if you broadcast the wrong thing. And also, if you connect to them and ask... If you trust, I mean, in, it depends how much you trust them, right? If it's actually like a merchant and you're doing these things, you'd be like, hey, I lost it. Um, but probably the safest thing is just like, you know, unplug and wait. Um, <laughs> the, the, the ways to mitigate that are one, don't crash your hard drive, obviously. Two, you know, make backup, make real time backups. So have multiple computers where very soon after you've updated to state three, you, you know, sort of update that on the backup. So the, the third-party monitoring service also can be sort of real-time, where you, as soon as actually, during the process of creating state three, you send this data and, and all the data to the third-party monitorer, and it means nothing to them, but if you ask them later, you're like, hey, I forget what state I'm in. They can tell you and get you synced back up. Synced back up. Um, and so, so yeah, so you need sort of concurrent backups. Uh, like offline backups where you you're have latency and stuff can be dangerous. Okay, um, well, okay, so yeah, delete old states. There's a bunch of like tricky parts of that and, and some of it may be sort of user dependent where you have to sort of tell users, hey, don't make backups and restore them blindly because that can be very dangerous here. Um, okay, wait, I sort of skipped, well, yeah, I'll skip it for now. Um, Okay, so the, the actual message flow, we can get into the really gory details since that seems to be a lot of the questions about that. Um, the message flow for funding a channel. And then, so the, all the code is, is on GitHub. Uh, this, this particular process is in the fund.go file. Um, but I'll explain. Okay, so Alice wants to open a channel with Bob. And in the current software, channels are all funded by a single party. Um, I want to make dual funded channels. That would be cool. It's kind of complex and the UI can be very tricky. So we just haven't done it yet. Um, but if anyone wants to, if, you know, if anyone opens a PR like next week, it's like, hey, dual funders. Like, whoa, cool. I didn't do that for like a year and you just did it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the basic idea, Alice connects to Bob and says, hey, um, tell me a pub key. It, it's not really a pub key because it never shows up. It's never used as a pub key, but it's just a point on the curve. Um, and they say their own pub key. They say, hey, here's my pub key. What's yours? Bob responds, 
Here's a pub key. So at this point, Bob has lost nothing, right? Bob has no idea who Alice is. They could be a total scammer. But if they just want a public key, yeah, sure, fine. Here's 33 bytes. Alice then connects back and says, hey, here's this description of this channel I'm going to build with you. We're going to enter into a kind and loving relationship, and here's how it's going to work. And Bob's like, really? Okay, well, there's this, you know, here's the amount in the fund, you know, amount funded. Here's all the fee rates. Here's everything, the description of the channel. And Bob says, you know what? This sounds cool because I'm going to get money. Uh, I like, you know, and then you can acknowledge that channel um, by signing off. Uh, and the channel acknowledgement also contains the first transaction, right? So the channel description and acknowledgement, basically Alice is saying, hey, the first state is you have one coin and I have nine. And then Bob says, okay, I will acknowledge that and also give you my signature, you know, sending to this first state transaction. Uh, and then Alice then funds it themselves. So Alice only has revealed the TXID so far, right? Alice doesn't show anything about her funds, her inputs. Um, the channel description and acknowledgement just say, look, I'm going to make a channel. Here's the TXID. Also, it's going to be the zeroth or first output or, you know, the, the, the out point. Um, so Bob doesn't know if this is legit at all. Alice hasn't proved that she has any money. But Bob has zero risk here, right? He's like, cool, you're going to send this thing where I get a coin? Sounds cool. Um, and then Alice, you know, they've both created state one. Alice then actually funds it, right? Creates her transaction, broadcasts it, and then shows Bob, hey, look, I broadcast it. Uh, here's a proof that it's in a block and we have a channel now. And Bob's like, great, this is cool. Um, the other, the messages for pushing funds in a channel. What, sorry? This happens instantly. This actually, I haven't implemented that. It just looked like that was sort of an idea that, Hey, we should make a proof so that the, we, it's sort of an anti denial of service thing where if, what if we do millions of these, uh, and then they're gonna have to look on the blockchain. So we could provide a proof, but really Bob just looks for the transaction on the blockchain themselves. Um, it's pretty easy. Uh, and then I'll go into how uh, funds flow in terms of pushing and pulling, so like making new states. Yes. Wait, so, okay, so R in the multi-hop case. Yeah. Uh, operations, like... There's opcodes checking R. Yeah, you, you do, you know, op... So you have the data, the, you have H, and you have op hash 160, and then op equal verify, right? So it's actually very similar, because in, um, in normal pay to script hash, or pay pay to pub key hash payments in Bitcoin, you have the same sequence of opcodes where you say, okay, I've got a hash, provide me the pre-image of that hash. And then in, in regular P2PKH, it then says, okay, now use this pre-image as a public key and I need to verify a signature. Uh, this doesn't do that step. This just says, look, provide a pre-image and then here's this other key that I'm, I'm going to request a signature for. Um, so I can, like, I can go, I don't know if I have the opcodes in a slide. I have, well, I could, hold on. Yeah, well, uh, hold on. Um, well, no, I don't have the script for, uh, do I? This is the, okay, there's. Well, that's the script that, that doesn't use. That, that's the integrated one that just has the relative time lock. Um, but but the, the HTLC one is has a op hash 160, op check, op, op equal verify. You know, just data, you know, H, op hash 160, op equal verify. And that's just those three, you know, those three things will then say, okay, the only way I can progress through this in the op codes is to know what R is. Um, this one's a little different. This was, the, this is the, my, you know, my money in a day or your money right away if you know this secret. Um, the nice thing is that the secret sort of disappears from the, it's just, there's two keys, right? This is the revocation key and this is the timeout key. Um, so if you have the revocation key, you can sign immediately. And if you don't, you have to do this uh, op check sequence verify delay, drop that and then check the signature there. Um, so it's pretty short scripts for these, both of these. Okay, so 
the push when you're trying to update new states. This is actually kind of tricky. This is a lot trickier than this one. And there's still a bug in my code somewhere because sometimes this like breaks. Um, and you don't lose money, but the channel like get like both sides have a different view of the channel. I need to fix that. Okay, so in this example, um, Alice and Bob are both at state four and they have different amounts of coins in their channel. Alice has 66, Bob has 25. Alice wants to send some money to Bob. Alice says, okay, I'm now sending three coins to Bob. Uh, the state gets updated. Alice says, okay, my delta, like the, the delta here is negative three. I'm losing three coins during this state update. But she still has 66 in that if you unplug the computer right now, you can see that, okay, I was trying to send negative three, but I still have 66, right? The, the states that I can broadcast still give me that. Alice then creates a, so a message and says, okay, look, we're updating our state. I'm telling you, I'm sending you three coins and here's my signature for the next state, right? State number five. Bob receives this and says, okay, Bob immediately updates his state to five, updates his amount to increase three, but also has the delta of three. Uh, so Bob, Bob has like, as soon as Bob gets that signature, he's got more money. Right. He can he can close the channel right now with this transaction. Um, Alice, however, cannot. Right. From Alice's point of view, she still has the 66. She can't close at state five because she hasn't received Bob's signature. Bob then responds and says, OK, I'm going to give you a signature and a revocation. So I'll give you my signature for state number five with the updated balance. I'm also going to reveal to you secret number four. Right. So that if I ever try to broadcast state four, you can take all my money. There's no reason. Bob clearly prefers state five to state four, but still you always just give everyone uh, the secrets every time you update. Even though you, yeah, like even though that's sort of like, well, why? I've, obviously I would only broadcast five, not four. Uh, it's just simpler in the code. And also we have these like fun data structures so that all the secrets form a giant tree and it's like a reverse Merkle tree. And it's kind of cheesy, but I called it an Elkrum because it's like Merkle backwards. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's this like, it's like a Merkle tree, but but um, the leaves can sort of, if you know the root, you can get all the leaves. Whereas in Merkle trees, if you know the leaves, you can get the root. Um, so that way you only have to store log n secrets. So if you have like a billion different states, you only have to store a couple hundred, or a couple dozen things. Yeah. Uh, I'm missing like one key concept. Mm -hmm. Wait, clear, what, do, what do you mean by clear out? Well, I guess I mean like publish or uh, close the state um, four when she gets the secret. Alice can publish state four now, yes. Right, it, it, where, wait, our snapshot, like if this is what happens. Mm, but it, it would be with the minus three, it wouldn't be with the, with the 66, so I guess it would be with the 63 amount. Um, hold on. If Alice broadcasts, okay, here's the thing. Um, Alice's, sorry, it's a little, Alice's secret and Bob's secret are not, are, are, they have their own secrets, right? So if Alice broadcasts state four, Bob needs Alice's secret number four to grab all the money. Right, so, so each side has their own transaction uh, and their own two secrets. So if Alice, Alice can broadcast state four right now. And that'll be fine. And Bob can't do anything about it. Bob can't. Yeah, right. Alice, Alice. Okay, Bob sends this. Alice now has the. Before that, sorry, but Alice can put broadcast state four. But at that point in time, uh, when Bob could broadcast state five. Yep. And so if Bob just stops. Uh, yeah, let's let's say right here. Yes. Either and either one. Oh, sorry, Alice cannot broadcast state. Wait, are we? We should go and see. Okay, right here at this time, Alice cannot broadcast state five. She doesn't have the signature, yeah. right? Bob can broadcast either four or five. If Bob broad, broadcasts five, Alice can't do anything about it. If Bob just stops chatting with Alice, mm -hmm. and Alice after a 
five price pools the, the channel, five mm -hmm. pools take mm -hmm. four. Alice and can do that. But Bob has paid five. So he could publish paid mm -hmm. five. Yep, and it's a race. Miners get to decide. All right, so during this process, it's not really clear who's got how much money, right? At the end of the process, there's a clear, okay, here's the balance. But as it's pro proceeding, both of these states can be valid. Uh, so, so Alice can sort of say, look, I've sent the money, uh, but I haven't really sent it. It hasn't really finished, right? And Bob's like, okay, I've gotten the money, but I haven't really gotten it yet. Uh, and so the end of this sequence, both parties will say, okay, we're, we're done. Mm -hmm. State four, if, if Alice publishes state four, it's not like Bob's going to take all the amount. Okay, where? When? <laughs> I guess I didn't get the part where if you publish a previous state, the mm -hmm. other person can take Yes, all so if Alice publishes state four and Bob has secret number four, Bob can take all the money. So. Uh, there. <laughs> Didn't get there yet. <laughs> yeah, Bob gets secret four at the end. But at this point, when secret Which, four gets pushed out... Who's, wait, wait, we, sh we should say who's secret number four. Okay. Alice has a secret four and... When Bob gets Alice's secret number four... At the very end, yes. He can then clear... Uh, why can't he then... Oh, okay, because then Alice isn't going to publish that secret number four. Yeah, as soon as Alice sends off secret number four, Alice is like, I am never going to publish this one because... Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 tricky. And and it's like even in the code it's like they and me and it's it's like yeah. You have, you have, you have these like uh, ch these stopgap checks every time where where uh, you're you're invalidating the previous state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's oh, yes. So you're still saying that any intermediate state whoever publishes first will be overridden by yep. miners by fucking the fee. Yeah. So so you know like at, at this state right now Bob's got both and Bob has the option to broadcast both. He hasn't revealed secret number four, so he can do whichever he wants. He'll probably do five, because he likes that one better. Alice only has the option to do four. At this state, um, where Alice now has updated, Bob can only broadcast five. If he tries to broadcast four, Alice can take all the money, because he's already revealed secret four. Alice can also, but Alice can still broadcast four at this state. Um, Alice can get to this point, and say, okay, well, we're in, we're sort of both in state five, but I can broadcast four. I haven't told you secret number four yet, so I can sort of undo the payment, um, and that's okay. You know, I mean, it's it's okay in that, like, if you get this far and then Alice unplugs, Bob says, look, I never got your money, right? I never got your secret revoking state number four, so like that was not a valid payment. And so, like, UI wise, this happens, this happens, and then. Okay, the this, the channel balances is up, have updated. While this procedure is happening, uh, the UI doesn't show the new payment as having completed. Um, even though it well, it sorry, it depends, right? Alice, uh, sorry, Bob shows. Wait, how does that work? In this code, does Bob show the new? I think it doesn't. Right, because like if Bob, you don't want to show the user. No, I'm pretty sure it doesn't, right? At this point, Bob's software could say, hey, you have 28, because you sort of do, um, but but you shouldn't show that to Bob, because Bob will think, hey, I've got 28. And like, yeah, you can broadcast having 28, but Alice can still broadcast having uh, 66 and you only having 25. Um, but once this happens, then Bob updates, and they're like, okay, we're all good. Um, both of us can only update a, up, only broadcast a single value, uh, and we're in agreement. The other, the other part that I think is still the buggy part, which works, but like sometimes it doesn't, um, is what happens when two people try to pay each other at the exact same time? So you send a you know amount with a new signature for state number five instead of a response with state number five secret and state you know here's five signature and here's secret four. Instead of a response like this, you get an equivalent of that where they're trying to send you money. And that can happen, right? That's easy to, to do on the computer. You just, like, both people press enter at the same time, and you both get those two messages. Then there's an even more complex sequence of messages where you, like, create this, like, transient state that doesn't have anything in it and then get rid of it and, like, sum the two payments and then create state six, which you then both agree on. Uh, it's a little ugly. 
Uh, <laughs> but it does work, but there's still some bugs I need to fix. Um, OK, so that's that whole complex process. Uh, any further questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, right, so the, the total amount in the channel is fixed while the channel exists, right? You can't, if there's, an, you know, 100 coins in the channel, we want to update, well, we have to make a new channel, which you can. Uh, in Right now in the software, you just make more channels. Um, it'd be better to have something where you can, like, transition a channel and add a new, add some more funds. Uh, I don't have that yet. Um, but, yeah, so so the channels, the total thing is, is fixed. Also, you shouldn't get too far on one side or the other in terms of, like, if... If Alice says, look, I have like zero coins or like 0 0.001 coins and Bob has like 99, that's very dangerous because the uh, the broadcasting the wrong state becomes very cheap, right? If it's really like Alice has zero, well, why not just try to broadcast an old state? So Bob gets it all. He would have anyway, right? Uh, so if Alice actually has a zero balance, Alice should just go back to the, the state where she had the most, broadcast that when she wants to close. And yeah, Bob will try, probably get it all, but he would, you know, the, the normal correct thing is for Bob to get it all. So I might as well try to attack. Um, so you need some, like, for this whole punishment, like justice transaction to work, both parties need to have some money in the channel. Um, and that, so, so you're not able to go fully on one side or the other. How is that an issue? Because then you just close the channel, right? Right, but, it, but what if it's like, look, I, we've got this, this channel, right? And Alice says, look, Bob, I want to give you all 10. Bob should say no, right? Bob wants the money, but, but I want to give you all 10, but I want to leave the channel open so that you can give me some back later, right? Bob, Bob should not allow that because it's very risky. Instead, Bob should just say, look, if you want to give me all 10, just let's close the channel with me getting all 10. And then they can do that. Um, but, but saying, look, my output's going to be zero and your output's going to be all 10, um, Bob should, should be very skeptical of that because Bob's like, no, because then if that's the case, you have no loss by broadcasting any previous transaction. And I still, you know, it'll probably be fine. I'll, I'll just have to do this, which my computer will do automatically. But still, it's a risk, right? And I'm not going to allow that. Uh, so in the software now, there's some, like, minimum balance on both sides, which I think I was talking to Kale about that a bunch last week. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. What, what do you mean by locked? Uh, what do you mean? Like Alice should have, like she does have okay. two, right? Like, and so he wants to go somewhere else and pay the other amount. The, so the, these balances, the only thing you can do with these two Bitcoins is give them to Bob, right? And the only thing Bob can do with these eight coins is give them to Alice. Uh, you can do the multi-hop stuff where, hey, having Bob having eight coins that he can only give back to Alice could be useful if... Alice is connected to other people, right? And then you can do uh, whatever that was, uh, this whole kind of thing, where Bob can say, hey, Alice, I've got a bunch of coins. How about I give you one and you give it to someone else? Um, or failing that, you can just say, I want to close the channel. And I, I, you know, I've got eight coins, but instead of broadcasting state three, I connect to Alice and say, look, I want to actually send to these three different addresses with my eight, and you can pick whatever addresses you want to send with your two, and let's close it that way. Okay. Uh, okay. Wait. Demo. Mm, okay. It's two. So we have an hour and a half. Should we do the demo like at the end or now? Hmm. The next topic is discrete log contracts, which is somewhat similar, but has more math involved and more diagrammy stuff. <laughs> uh, but we could try. Like, yeah, whatever. I have like an hour and a half. That's a ton of time. Okay. Cool. Let's try to run lit. Because okay. So. No, let me, let me go to the stuff I skipped real quick. OK, so my implementation, uh, there's a bunch of people working on this stuff. Uh, two people at Blockstream, this company that I used to work for, uh, and then what I'm working at at MIT called Lit. Um, it's in Go, and it uses some BTCD libraries, which is uh, BTCD is an implementation of Bitcoin like Core, but in Go. And it's pretty good because the code is really readable. Um, it's it's lagged a bit in the last year or two, and that it doesn't seem like I think that a lot of the BTC guys started working on their own altcoin, 
And so there's not a lot of updates. But SegWit did get merged in. Uh, I rode it with Lalu, uh, and we he, Lalu did all the work to get it merged in. And um, so it runs okay. It's modular. It's got an SPV wallet built in, um, and it's hopefully stand you know easy to use and oh safe. Oops. Um, and it requires SegWit, and it doesn't have multi-hop yet, and but it does support like multiple different coins simultaneously. Um, so yeah, it's SPV, which which quick aside, SPV is dangerous. Uh, it's cool, but the idea is you only have to download like 20 megs instead of 150 gigs, uh, but it's got some risks. Um, normal nodes, when they're full, when they're a full node, you say, okay, I download, verify every block, verify every transaction. And the wallet functionality is, is pretty simple, but it's for every transaction, look at the outputs. And if one of those output scripts matches an address that you control, that's good. That means you just got money. Uh, and then take that transaction, you know, modify it into a UTXO and store it in your database. And also for every transaction that you see, uh, look at the inputs. And if the input is one of the UTXOs that you've got stored in your database, that's bad. That means you lost money. Um, and so you need to delete that UTXO from your set. Um, an SPV wallet, on the other hand, is different. You just look at the headers and you build a bloom filter, which is basically take all your addresses, all your UTXOs, sort of smush them through this kind of hash function-y thing. I'm not going to explain bloom filters. Um, but you send that bloom filter to a full node. And you say, hey, full node, here's this filter. Tell me about all the transactions that match this filter. Basically, tell me about all my transactions. Uh, and then that full node will send you back transactions matching the filter. Uh, when, every time you request a block. And that's nice because you only get the transactions that you care about, right? Nine, you know, almost all of the transactions in every block are people doing things who are not you and you don't care about their money. Um, you're just, just directly getting it. Um, this is problematic because it's really useful. So most, it seems that there's a lot of SPV wallet use. Um, Electrum, Multibit is if that's still a thing. Uh, a lot of the web wallet, like a lot of the um, phone wallets are SPV. Some are not even SPV. So things like uh, blockchain.info or uh, Mycelium or, or some other ones don't even give you this proof. And so you're completely reliant on the third on the server to tell you what's going on. Um, but SPV, even when done right, uh, it doesn't enforce network rules. So for example, if the Coinbase transaction has 100 coins coming out of nowhere, Sure, you, you can't verify that that's wrong. Maybe someone somewhere in the block paid a really large fee. Um, and you can't even tell what the fees are from transactions since you don't know the input amounts. You, you don't know anything, right? So you can't enforce any rules. You can't check signatures. So even if someone, it's a transaction that you're getting, you, you have no idea whether it's signed or not, right? Because you don't know what the previous input is, so you don't know what the previous PK script is. So you can see that there's a signature there, but that could be a completely random signature that someone just made up. Um, also, with the SPV as it's run today, with Bloom filters, the full node basically learns all of your addresses. That's really bad. Um, because as soon as you start using it, you're broadcasting to the rest of the world, hey, here's all my Bitcoins. Um, full nodes do not have this problem because they never tell anyone anything. right? They just receive all the data and then pick out the data that's relevant to them from that. Uh, and that's all local. So they just receive everything, send everything, and you never really get to tell how, what they're doing. Um, also, with SPV, the thing that like really bugs me is SPV wallets will often show unconfirmed transactions. Like, here's these transactions in the mempool. But they have absolutely no idea if they're true or not. Right? It's trivial to lie to SPV. You can just make a transaction saying, hey, look, you just got a million Bitcoins. Uh, and then make it look like a real transaction. But since they can't verify signatures, they can't tell if there was a UTXO before with those coins, They'll just the, the wallet will just show it. And it'll say unconfirmed, and it'll never confirm. But the wallet will say, like, yeah, million coins, cool. Um, so it's, it's very dangerous um, from the perspective of receiving funds, which is, which is somewhat counterintuitive. For many people think the security is just based on I need to control my money, right? I need to have my private keys. I don't want anyone to steal them. And I need to have full control over that. Um, but also an aspect is I need to know when I've received money. And that's what full nodes are really helpful for. Um, and people are usually not as aware of these things in that like most people aren't merchants and merchants are the ones who have to worry like when I'm taking a $20 bill, is it a real $20 bill? Um, and, and you have to worry about that kind of thing. And SPV is really crummy for that. Anyway, um, there's ways to fix it. Um, 
One is just to download everything and not store it. That helps with some things. Um, there's ideas of committed block filters, which may be implemented someday, which would be cool in that the filters are on the full node side instead of the client side. So the full node can say, look, here's the bloom filter of this entire block. And then you can download that little bloom filter, see if it matches anything you're interested in. And if it is, download the whole block. Uh, that preserves a lot better privacy and also um, makes it so the full nodes can't lie. So in this, in this case, um, you're, ask, you're saying, hey, here's a bloom filter. Tell me about my transactions. The full node can just omit things. And there's no way you'll ever know. Um, and that's very dangerous in Lightning. So this specifically, the reason I'm sort of interested in strengthening SPV is because in Lightning, if you don't find out about a transaction, you could lose all your money, right? If they broadcast an old state and you don't find out about that and you just wait and then they get their money after a few blocks or, you know, a few days, uh, there's, there's no way you can get that back. Um, so you need to be aware of all the transactions and it's really critical. And with normal Bitcoin wallets, if you don't find out about a transaction where you got money, well, eventually, hopefully, you'll find out about it, uh, but there's no rush. And you know, worst case, you just don't think you got paid. Uh, but in this case, someone closing a, a channel, you need to know ASAP. Okay, so that so yeah, so there's there's ways to wait. So Lit uses SPV, and we can try using it now. And um, okay, hold on. So wait, there's software. Okay, do people have, I see a lot of MacBooks, and then, like, okay, who's running Linux? Oh, okay, some, okay. Uh, <laughs> who's running Windows? Oh, fewer than Linux, okay. Um, well, I have binaries here, if you want to, and don't want to compile. Uh, if you want to, com if you have Go, you can just run this command. I'm not sure if that'll actually work. Um, it might, and then it might give some errors. I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but the idea, anyway, of Go is that it's really easy to, like, to deals with dependencies and stuff. Um, and if you say that, it, I think it compiles. Ah, it compiles, but then when you try to compile lit-af, it doesn't, and it requires a dependency, and you can go get that. It's no big deal. Um, or if you don't want to bother, you can get some binaries here. And this is on this computer, which has that IP address on the Stanford visitor thing. So hopefully that works. And... Um, you can't ping it? Uh, it's still got the same IP address. Let me see. Netstat. You're good. Wait, so, sorry? Can you, can you connect to... Okay, let me see. Oh, there's a bunch of people connected. Look at that. All right, they're all downloading stuff. Yeah, wow. Okay, so some people are able to do this. Uh, it may limit number of concurrent users. Yeah, because look at these like sin receive. I don't know. Okay, well, it looks like this. <laughs> and you can download the binaries you want. Uh, lit is the actual server, the, the node. And lit-af is the like RPC client. Uh, I named these to encourage undergrads at MIT to get involved and think it's cool. Uh, I'm not sure the names will stick forever, but for now. Um, advanced functionality. Uh, <laughs> no, it says that in the, in the code. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah. Okay, people are downloading stuff. I guess it's saturating Wi-Fi probably because it's. Yeah. So, okay, I, I can do it like interactively. Yeah, there's there's a readme on GitHub. Hold on. Okay, so this is a little weird. Uh, okay, so if you want to run lit, I have the bind. No, I don't have the binaries here. Shoot. Okay, hold on. Uh, let's say you like. Let's say you're compiling it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say go build dash v, and then it builds the binary, and I've got lit. And I can put it somewhere, like in a folder. Um, so make dir demo uh, copy lit to demo. And then I also need to go into cmd lit af for the uh, RPC client. Go build this. 
So okay, if you download the binaries, you don't need to do these things. You'll just get your uh, architect, you know, your OS's binary. If it's Windows, get the .exe, and I put Mac at the end of the Mac ones. Uh, okay, so copy lit AF to demo. Okay, so now I can go into demo, and I've got lit and lit AF, and lit I will run with uh, reg. Well, it's localhost for me, but I'll put in the right number. Well, we also need yeah, you need both. Uh, should I put? Uh, uh, how do I do that? Hmm. No, that doesn't make it larger. Uh, no, that just makes pluses. <laughs> uh, well, let me let me copy it to a different thing. Oh, um. But wait, I need to know my IP address. Oh wait, uh, hold on. Okay, this this has got. Uh, so I'm running a node. I'm running a um, Bitcoin full node, but it's just reg test. So I can say Bitcoin CLI generate a hundred. Okay, sorry. Bitcoin D. Okay, I'll run Bitcoin D. Daemon. Reg test. And then I can generate 100 blocks very quickly. Okay, lots of blocks. Um, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to have to give people money. Uh, I guess in Slack we can do that. Okay, so the the... The thing to run, the command line to run with, wait, I'll just go into Slack. That's going to be easier because you're going to be, it's easier to copy and paste. You don't have to read stuff off the, uh, off the screen, right? So I'm going to do, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, well, anyway, it's that. Yeah. Lit, reg, same IP address, dash V. And you should get, oh man, two screens is kind of. Hold on, I'll show you. Does this work? Okay, and then Lit will ask you for a passphrase. You can just press enter if you don't care about security, because you shouldn't here, because it's just for fun. And then, oh, it gets lots of blocks, and it's done. Um, and then you can also go to demo and then run lit AF and it'll con uh, connection refused. That's not good. <laughs> connection refused. Am I running? Eight oh one two. I must have made a typo. And then it works. Shoot, I must have put a typo in somewhere. Anyway, uh, this is listening on port eight oh one two. Anyway, now I have uh, money. So wait, I'll make a chan. So how about I make a channel? We have like another twenty minutes. We can do this. Um, I'll make a channel on the Slack called Lit, and people can post their addresses and stuff, and then I can send everyone money. Um, hold on. There's, what do you mean light? So this is the stuff that ends with, starts with RT1 is a Segwit BEC32 address. And the normal ones are, and we can use either, but um, okay. So I just made a channel called lit in the Slack. And I'll say, and I'll, Uh, 
Okay, and then I will send myself a bunch of money and distribute it to you guys. Um, how many? A thousand coins. That should work, right? Da -ding! And I got a thousand coins. Nice. This. Yes, I have a thousand coins. <laughs> okay, um, so one person posted a address. Our what? What? Oh, jeez. Um, and then maybe everyone can post some uh, addresses. They will look like R, R T one Q something something something. Uh, post that, and we'll send you money. So, Udi, who? Where's Udi? Yeah. Hey, I'll give you like five hundred, and then you can give it to lots of people. Um, Okay, so how do I so to send in, in lit you say send. I don't see the channel. You don't see what? The channel. You don't have any channels yet. No, the black channel. It's called yeah. It's just called lit. I think you press plus next to channels and then it'll like let you join the lit channel. People are joining, yeah, hopefully. Uh, Double click? I don't know. <laughs> I guess. I don't, I haven't, sorry, I don't. Other people who, are, some people have gotten it to run on Mac, hopefully. So, yeah, there's two. There's lit Mac and lit AF Mac. And I think they're both run on Mac. Password? Yeah, it wants a passphrase to, to encrypt your private keys, but you can just press enter. You can put a password if you want to secure your reg test coins, but you know you can just enter if you want. Okay, so wait, Udi's got 500 coins. Okay, cool. And then anyone else who's on uh, the Slack, and you can post your addresses, and we'll distribute money. I'll send more to R Durst as well. And uh, wait, no, that's the same address. Oh, no. I didn't copy it. That's right. Okay. 200 coins. Oh, also, in lit, it's all Satoshis. It doesn't do Bitcoin. So wait, lit Mac does not run, you mean? Hold on. Oh, okay, lit Mac is the Linux binary. That's wrong. Uh, hold on, let me recompile. Nope, sorry, I must have, so go OS equals star win. Okay, I will cross compile for Mac. Takes a second, because it's, sorry, yeah, so I guess lit Mac was not the right file. Uh, run, yeah, run lit first, because lit AF connects to it, so, okay, hold on. Yeah, that, that's the RP. So lit itself is a server, like Bitcoin D, and lit AF is like Bitcoin CLI. What is the common? Uh, what, sorry? What is the common for Just LS. It'll, you already have an address that it starts with. Um, you don't need to run Bitcoin D. You can all connect to this Bitcoin D.
Yeah, it's all SVV'd. It's not, it's not fully secure. Uh, okay, so now there's a new lit Mac on the, on the HTTP server, which may work. Try that. Um, I, I don't have a DMS file. I have, hold on. This should be what they are. And now LitMac is new file. And see, can you download it and see if that? It, DMS? I don't know. That's, I mean, can you just download it and save it? That, so wait, did you get the new LitMac? Yeah, I updated it. I put a new file. Okay, I'm gonna send more people funds. Uh, oh yeah, so so if you if people want to send each other funds, um, hold on, uh, hold on. Uh, and I gotta keep confirming transactions as well. Um, So I will send Jeff a hundred coins. But you have to when you're sending to each other, um, it's Satoshi's. So a hundred is hundred with one two three four one two three four more zeros, and then it'll send. Confirm. Um, okay. So are people like sending each other stuff? Did you get any? Oh, yeah. We don't have like wired wires are good. It's kind of, let's see, okay. Yep, you should see your transactions in LS uh, if someone sends you anything. And in lit, when you're in the window where you have lit running, it should tell you like, hey, you got, you know, you got money. Like it'll show all this kind of stuff where like you've got this new transaction which gives you money. Look in there. Yeah, GUIs are impossible. I don't know. I tried to make one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually was working on it last week. There's like no good GUI libraries, and I, I do need to make one. But uh, for this now, I, I don't. For Go or even Python, I tried to do this thing in Python with like Python GTK, and I like spent like two days on that. No, I'm not gonna use JavaScript. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so wait. Udi to to Shigeya. That was a con confirmed transaction. Uh, anyone else who's got it running? Post addresses. Okay, Alexi wants money. Got it. Give me money. Here we go. Okay, 50 coins. One, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Boom, done. 50 coins sent. Wow, there's, okay, so there's some people, there's only like five or six people connected. I guess people are still downloading. I know. Okay. Well, uh, we need more peer. We need like BitTorrent. Uh, I should have done that. <laughs> okay. Our grant. Okay. Our grant. Getting some coins here. What's that? You got it? Lit Mac and Lit AF Mac? Okay. So post an address and I'll send you some, some coins. No, no, I just need the, your, your RT1Q address. In Lit AF it'll show you. 
What do you mean? Uh, yeah, lit. Okay, yeah, Udi just posted. That's the right command to run. Okay, so someone asked how to send to each other. You just type send, or I'll put it in here. Uh, I don't think we've gotten there yet. Uh, maybe I don't think so. Posting in in the lit channel. Okay. If yeah, if you have if you some if you get errors or something's not working, post in the the lit channel on Slack. We can try. Once people have sort of gotten, let's see. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of connections. Still a lot of people downloading binaries, maybe, and then a bunch of 18444s. Cool. So what's that thing surrounding the address? Uh, the parentheses, or the, what, what do you mean? Yeah, the R, T, that's Okay, so, so the two addresses. Um, the first one, the RT1, is a BAC32 SegWit address. And so those are like SegWit coins in a sense that like you're sending it to an output that uses SegWit. So you can send from those and it's non-malleable. Um, it also comes with the old address, which is just a regular base 58 address, and that's a non-SegWit output. So if you want to make a channel, you have to have money in a SegWit address first. So it's okay though, if you, re if you receive funds, and it'll say, like on here, uh, non-witness in your UTXO. So I'll, I'll post this. Um, I'll post an example here in this. Um, okay, so then, yeah, if you want to, if you guys have money and want to start creating channels with each other, you need to say list for listen, and then you need to connect to each other over TCP IP. Um, you might want to use uh, Slack direct messages to message people your address, your um, your IP address. Start. I think you got 500, right? 
<laughs> okay, then you should, you know, send more people stuff. I've got a lot. I mean, it's reg test, so like, you know, we can just make as many as we need. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, eventually. So if the coloring doesn't work, you should complain to Kali because he wrote the coloring code, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so wait, you said before you can send address amount, no, you don't need any kind of TCP IP connection to the, your counterparties. Um, the, the commands to create a channel is fund, and so you can type fund and it'll give you, you know, say, okay, you need fund, peer, coin type, capacity, send. Um, so if you want, if okay, people can make channels with me. Let me find my IP address here. So if anyone wants to create a channel with me, my laptop right now, um, it's here's my public key. So to create a channel, to, to connect to me, you'd say con this at, uh, where's my IP address? 10, 21. <laughs> One nine two. Okay, so that will if you type what I just put in Slack, you will connect to my instance of lit. Um, and I'm already connected to someone and I can say hi. Say one hi. There. I just said hi to whoever connected to me. Now I'm connected to two people. Say yeah. Okay. I don't yeah, people are connecting in. Cool. Um they can message me if you if you just say say space one space a message it yep woohoo okay someone just <laughs> messaged me so yeah there's like a built-in chat client that's oh foo okay yep <laughs> uh, there's a third person say three yo um okay so this is you know oh four you can't where well, you can, when when polo? Ah, I see. <laughs> okay, so you can do that to connect, and then I can start making channels with people. So the way that I do that, I'll say fund. I'm going to fund with peer one, whoever that was. Um, and I'm going to use, oh, I have to say coin type, which is 257. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Um, and then the capacity is one coin. And I will initially send zero. Ba-doom. Oh, okay, I created a channel. So now I've got a channel here with up here, and let me confirm it. Okay, so now it's at height for 517. Um, let me generate another 100 blocks. Uh, and then I can push into that channel. Push channel one, a bunch of coins. Cool. Okay, now I don't, wait, who is my counterparty for channel one? Okay, cool. So now you have a channel with some coins in it, but not that many. Let me send you more. There, now you have most, now you have half of the coins. Here, now you have most of them. Okay, so we're at state four in that channel, and you can push them back, or you can close it. Uh, the, the way to close it non-interactively is called break. So you can say break channel one. Oh, it's messages from DEO. So I'll fund more channels with people. Fund three, 257. There, made a channel. Oh, must wait. Uh, yes, okay, so I have to wait until it's confirmed. Yo, did, yeah, okay. There, now I pushed some money. Cool. So yeah, you guys can start making channels with each other. Uh, it's a little annoying because you have to know your IP addresses. And... You need to know the yeah. You need to know the public key, the LN1 address, and the IP address. Um, there's a way to do it just with the LN1 address because there's a server at MIT, but I think I unplugged it. Uh, that would cache IP addresses for different for different uh, pub key hashes, but I think it stopped working. And but yeah, eventually, like in real life, that should have all sorts of stuff. Wait, based on an IP address, can People can't connect to you. So when you say listen for listen to incoming connections, 
So you just say LIS, it will tell you your pub key. Um, and then after that, it will also tell you, you know, listening for connections on ports with key LN1, whatever. Uh, so that's that's like your, it's not an address for receiving payments. It's a re an address for people to connect to you uh, over IP. Um, okay, so any questions? I think we'll do this for another like five minutes. I'll sort of walk around and if people have questions, uh, and then we can take a break for five minutes and then we can go to the next set of slides. Does that sound good? Cool. Okay, well, I will, I need like a bash script or something to do this, or I can just occasionally keep generating blocks. Um, I can make a bash script. Nah, I'll just do it. Um, okay, so I'll I'll look around at people's stuff. Okay, this one works. This one does. Okay, so I'll go to the next set of slides. Um, just as a like, let me actually. Um, actually, so so if you're interested in this stuff and want to work on it, um. Like it's all open source. This is not like all I do at work, but this is a big part of what I do at work is work on lit and you know have more people run the code and oh new issues what doesn't work. So like you know people people are contributing to it and I'm working on this. My most recent branch is I tried to make a UI and like I got kind of like UIs are horrible. Um, so yeah, I was last when was this like last week? No, like earlier this week. Okay, three days ago. And like I started making a UI, and I don't really want to work on UI. So if anyone's like good at making UI, then cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm very receptive to any kind of pull request. It's pretty small right now because there's not a ton of people working on it, um, but I'd like more. So if you're interested in it, want to work on open source stuff, there it is. Um, OK, cool. So that's my, my spiel, my pitch for getting more code for free. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it is, it's, it's not a company, right? Like I work at MIT at the Digital Currency Initiative, uh, which is a, they fund some core developers like Vladimir and Corey who work on Bitcoin Core. They also fund me, but this is maybe like half of my work. I also work with a bunch of students and like teach stuff. Um, so they sort of get paid to work on it, but it's not like I'm making money off of it. And if I was like, I don't want to work on Lit anymore. I want to do other stuff. They, they would still, you know, they wouldn't care. Um, so it's not super commercial. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us something about A320? A320? Oh, thing. Rob's thing. Rob's thing. Yeah, it's, I don't, because Rob's talking to all these central banks. I, I personally don't really think the central banks are going to make like Bitcoin-like dollar things, but they might someday. Uh, and so he's sort of running like economic simulations with a different coin. Uh, that has like in oh okay yeah no rob sits next to me we work on like so and then there's one of his uh student one of the students that works with him also contributes to lit sometimes because they want to get like payment channels working on their currency as well but it's all just internal like having fun with it yeah no people yeah we can make an ico we can have like mit coin <laughs> yeah um no, I just we're. Want, I just want more good ones. Well, we have Bitcoin. It's a pretty good one. Um, <laughs> so I I tend to work on Bitcoin and and well, like. Yeah. Think the whole world's gonna create a reserve currency. Well, they might. Who knows? Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people who are like coming to MIT and it's like, let's do an ICO, and I just ignore them at this point. Um, <laughs> And sometimes it's annoying because like there's students at MIT and then you go and you're like, yeah, I'll meet with you. And then you start talking and then like 30 seconds into the conversation, you're like, oh, he just wants to do an ICO. How do I get out of this? And like, <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, okay, I'll do, I only have, oh, I only have like not that much time. Shoot, okay, I'll have to go quick or I might go over a tiny bit. Um, okay, so I'll talk about discrete log contracts, which is the next thing sort of built on lightning. Okay, I'm Taj, I work at the Media Lab. I uh, work on lit. You already know this. Okay, so this is a newish thing. I'm gonna actually, it's a little weird. I'm gonna be presenting this 
and like very similar slides, but cut down uh, tomorrow at Scaling Bitcoin, which is like in this building. Um, so if you are going to that and you might want to tune out for the talk I give tomorrow, because it'll be basically the same thing. Um, it's sort of new, which is kind of cool. I haven't coded much of it, but people are working on it apparently. Um, and it's kind of kind of fun math. And so this will be mostly about the math. Okay, so I can skip the recap of Lightning Network. Okay, so you guys did the elliptic curve stuff, right? A little bit? Okay, so I'll go real quick. Um, basically, you've got these operations you can do. With regular numbers, I'll make lowercase. Uh, you can add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them. Everything's easy. Um, with uppercase numbers, which are points on the curve, you can add and subtract them, but you can't multiply a point times a point, and you can't divide a point by a point, right? That's not defined. So add and subtract, okay, no multiplication. Uh, and then what if you mix these things? You cannot add a point and a scalar, right? That doesn't make sense. You can't subtract a point and a scalar. That doesn't make sense. However, you can multiply a point by a scalar, and you can divide a point by a scalar. Um, so that's kind of cool. Now that gives us everything we need to do to make signatures. Um, okay, wait, so I did not, sh I should have looked through. The elliptic curve talk yesterday, did you go through signatures? Okay, so I can s sort of go quick here. Um, sort of recap, you got G, pub key, let's say your, your private key is A, your pub key is A times G or big A. Um, and you can, you know, A times G plus B times G is A plus B times G. So that's sort of the big homomorphic property where the sum of private keys equals the sum of public keys. That's very important, and that's sort of the whole point. Um, so the, in Lightning, you can have this revocable key, where the thing with, um, what was it, Alice gives Bob this secret, right? And it's like, okay, it's Bob's, it's Bob's key, but also needs Alice's secret. So you can say, okay, we've got two public keys, uh, A and B, big A and big B, and the sum of those two public keys is C. Right, Alice knows A, Bob, Alice knows private key A, Bob knows private key B, neither can sign with C. However, if Bob gives little b to Alice, Alice can now sign with C, right? But Bob cannot. Bob still doesn't know what the little c is, but Alice does, because it's just little a plus little b. Um, and this is similar, you know, here's the scripts for lightning, where you say, okay, it's pub key x or pub key y and time, right? That's the 100 block or this other pub key. Um, and that's a revocable output, where if I know this secret, I can grab it immediately. If I don't, the other person has to wait a while. Okay, so conditional payments is what this is all about. Um, we want to make a smart contract where instead of in Lightning, where it's just sequential, it can be conditional on a third-party oracle. So in this example, Alice and Bob can bet on tomorrow's weather. If it rains, Alice gets a coin. If it's sunny, Bob gets a coin. Um, the problem, there is no op weather in the Bitcoin blockchain. We're going to soft work that in next year. Um, okay, so smart contracts is sort of a poorly defined term, but uh, to some extent, Lightning Network uses smart contracts, right? This, hey, I have to wait a day or you can get it immediately. That's a very simple smart contract, but it is sort of a wait, a contractual, okay, like I get the money now or you get the money later given this other secret. Um, and in Lightning, it's used to enforce the most recent transaction, right? So you can't broadcast old transactions within the channel. Um, in Lightning, there's no external state, right? It's only concerned with the channel itself. The fact that it's raining or that there's, you know, a disaster doesn't affect your Lightning balance. Um, if you want the score of a baseball game to affect your balance within a channel, you need some way to get that data onto the blockchain or into your cryptographic system. And we call that an oracle. Um, so the simplest oracle system where we could make payouts conditional on an oracle's report is a two of three multi-sig oracle. And this is bad, but I'll, I'll go into why. So two of two multi-sig is not enough, right? If you say, okay, we're going to bet on the outcome of a baseball game, and we just do a two of two multi-sig output, and we send to there, uh, we might disagree. So... Uh, you say, oh, the, the Yankees won. No, I think the Red Sox won. It's like, no, clearly the Yankees won. It's like, well, I'm not signing. Uh, and this, this benefits rich players because rich players don't care as much about their money as poor players. Um, and so they'll say, well, yeah, maybe the Red Sox, you know, maybe the Yankees won. But look, uh, instead of you getting the coin, how about I'll sign something where you get like 0.7 and I get 0.3? 
And they're like, no, come on, that's a, don't be a jerk. It's like, all right, well, I'll, I'll just give you that, and I'll give you a time lock transaction for that. Um, and maybe next week, if you want it, I'll give you 0.8. And the week after, I'll give you 0.9. You know, eventually, you'll, you'll take one of these. I'm, I'm fine with like, keeping my money locked up for a while. So that's not good. Um, it works with friends, but Bitcoin is the currency of enemies. Um, and so <laughs> it sort of is, right? Like part of the interesting part of like, hey, we can buy and sell drugs. And like there's two people transacting who don't know each other and probably want to see each other in jail. And like it still works. Cool. Um, so a third party can decide in the case of a conflict. And that's a two of three multi-sig oracle. So you've got Alice, Bob, and Olivia. Alice and Bob can put their coins in and say, okay, we're betting on the, the baseball game. Um, and if they both agree, okay, yeah, the Yankees won. They can sign two of three, Alice and Bob sign, and they send it to whoever won. Um, if they fight or are unresponsive, one of them can con contact Olivia and say, hey, Olivia, Yankees won, sign this. And Olivia says, yeah, they did. Okay, sure. The problem is, uh, or I'm doing weather, not baseball. Uh, the problem is it's sunny, and Alice says Olivia, hey, Alice, or so, hey, it's Alice. Uh, say it's raining, and I'll give you 0.8, right? I'll get one Bitcoin but I'll send you 0.8 of them. Uh, and so you can bribe the Oracle, right? And the Oracle, if they have no skin in the game, says like, well, you know, who's going to pay me more, right? And if this is all trustless and, you know, it's, it's not a good system. Um, also, the, inter the Oracles are interactive. And so a two of three multi-sig Oracle would see every contract, right? Bef and the contracts are sort of not smart in that they're just enforced with like text initially saying, hey, we're going to do this two of three signing thing and only si you know, sign off on who gets the money based on the weather tomorrow. And then Olivia says, okay, I'll, that's what I'll agree to do. Um, they don't, don't just see it, they decide it and they can equivocate, right? They can say it's sunny in one contract and they can say it's raining in another contract. Um, it'd be better if they couldn't equivocate and even better if they never even saw the contracts. But how? Okay, so Schnorr, did you do Schnorr signatures or ECDSA? Okay, Schnorr signatures are way easier and better. Um, and hopefully we'll get them soon. Except Schnorr was kind of a jerk, so we're going to call them s aggregate signatures, I think, in the code. Because Schnorr patented this, and then no one could use it for like 20 years. So, so we're not going to give him his naming rights. Um, okay, so scalar, pub key, uh, hash function, m is some message. Um, so you come up with a random nonce k. Multiply by the generator to point to get R. That's the same as ECDSA. Uh, and then to sign, super simple. Your S equals K minus the hash of M and R concatenated times your private key. And the signature is R and S. Uh, and then to verify, given S, R, you already know the message and you know their pub key, you say, well, if S, you know, if S, equals k minus this hash times the private key, I can multiply both sides by g, and that's just s times g equals k times g minus this hash times a times g. Well, k times g is r. a times g is their public key, big A. And so I have all those things. So I just multiply the s that you give me, part of the signature, times g, and then see if that's equal to the, the difference, these two things. Uh, so it's very you know, straightforward to do. So with discrete log contracts, we do something a little fancy. We fix the R point. So normally in signatures, this K value is, is created at the time of signing, where we you could either just come up with a totally random number uh, and use that to create R. Um, in practice, there's a system, uh, RFC 6979, which is K should be the hash, basically HMAC of your private key and the message being signed. Uh, so that it's deterministic, so you don't actually need entropy at this signing time, which is a little safer in case your random number generator doesn't work. Um, but anyway, K is generally created at signing time and used to create, you know, used and sent out with as R with the signature. Instead, what you could do is say, look, instead of the pub key being A and the signature being RS, let's call the pub key the the tuple of A and R. The the pub key is now two points, and the signature is just S. Uh, the equations are exactly the same, and since R is random, you can now you can do the same equation where it's like, look, I give you k, like I have to commit to k and a, right? So k and a are fixed when I send my pub key, and I can compute s for any given message. Um, it's the same thing, but you can only sign once, 
right? So if you say, hey, here's the R I'm going to use, and here's the A I'm going to use, uh, you can only create one signature with that pair. Um, the reason is you get K collisions. This is a little, little ugly. Um, you can compute, given two signatures, given two S's, S1 and S2, with the same K, the same A, but different M's, you can compute A, right? So the way you do it is you subtract S1 from S2, right? And that's going to be K minus H M1 A minus K plus H M2 A. And that's equal, you can cancel out the Ks, right? Because you got K on both, uh, K and plus K and minus K. And now you've got the hash of message two times A minus the hash of matches one times A, which if you, you can factor out A, right? Because these are, these are different, but the A's are the same. So now I've got this whole thing times A, and everything here is known, right? It's message one, message two. You know what those are. You know what R is. You know this whole side. And so you can compute A. And so in full form, it's that. Um, and this fun fact, this is what brought down PlayStation 3 code signing long ago when GeoHot found that they were, you know, for Sony was using the same K value every time they signed a PlayStation 3 game. So you could compute A and get their private key and sign whatever you want. Um, but sorry? Uh, they actually did ECDSA, but so the, the equation is different with ECDSA, but the, the, the idea is the same, that if you, you know, you need this random point in there, otherwise you can correlate multiple signatures. Um, but yeah, if you did the ECDSA equation yesterday, you can sort of see how you, you'll get a similar way to compute the private key given two, given two signatures with the same R values. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting thing with this like fixed R. Another interesting property is you can anticipate a signature. So given a pub key and an R point, so if you, and we, we've now sort of redefined a public key to be like the public key and this R as well. Uh, for any message M, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. You cannot compute S, right? If you know A, R, and you know a message M, you can't compute what S is, but you can compute what S times G will be. You're right, you can compute S times G because that's just R minus the hash of the message in R times their public key. So for any given message, you can compute the signature times the generator point, but you don't know what the generator point is. And this sort of seems, hey, this is the elliptic curve discrete log problem. I know what the point is, but I don't know the scalar that gets me to that point. Um, and okay, I'm explaining it as if I thought of it this way. I came at it a completely different way and thought I had a totally new signature scheme and then talked to people in MIT are like, no, this is like a Schnorr signature scheme. So anyway, um, but, but it is kind of useful because um, I know A, I know R, I can compute S times G, and the signature itself reveals what S is. So use that as a public key and use S as a private key. Really, they're the same things, right? S, is, S times G is a point on the curve. S is a private key, essentially the same thing. But they're created via a signature process. So what you can do is you can say, um, this looks a lot like L Lightning Network. In fact, I just copied the entire same thing. Uh, but uh, this is state one, where it's sunny. This is state two, where it's rainy. And state three, where there's a solar eclipse, let's say, is here. Now, Olivia pre-commits to a public key and an R sub weather. And it looks a lot like, LN, like Lightning Network. But instead of making the output sequentially as time goes on, they make all the inputs at the very beginning. Right? So they sign off on all three of these states when they're creating the contract. And the other part is, instead of the, the secret that used to be where we could revoke our states, is now Olivia's signature. Right? We know what Olivia's signature times the generator point will be, so we can add those secrets into our public keys. And when Olivia signs, that's the same as in Lightning Network, revealing the secret for the old state. Right, so instead of trying to get the most recent, we now try to get uh, whatever Olivia signs off. What's nice is Olivia can't see that any of this is happening. And even after it gets broadcast onto the blockchain, they can't tell that that's what it was, right? Because it's mixed in with someone else, some other public key, so it just looks like another random point on the curve. Um, so it's kind of cool. Uh, you have signatures as private keys. Unknown scalar, but you know what it is times the generator point. That's a key pair. Um, so... Olivia's S is the private key, S times G is public key, mixed with Alice and Bob's public keys, right? So pub Alice plus 
SG equals pub contract. The private key for Alice then plus S is the private key for the contract. Um, so there's three possibilities here. Uh, either, so Alice, uh, sorry, Olivia says, I'm going to sign one of three messages. I'm either going to sign the text sun, the text rain, or the text eclipse. And there's three signature keys that can be created through this, right? It's going to be, so in the case of sun, it's S sub sun times G is R minus the hash of the message sun concatenated with R times the public key. Um, and so Alice and Bob now have public keys that are their public keys plus the sun public key or the rain public key. And so this public key is, you know, Alice pub sub rain is Alice will know how to sign with this if Olivia signs the message rain, right? Because it's her public key plus this rain public key. Uh, so it's the same exact script as in Lightning Network, which is op if public, you know, pub r, op else delay. Uh, and in Lightning, the correct use is timeout, the timeout one, right? So if you broadcast, you're going to have to wait 100 blocks and then you can get your money. If you broadcast the wrong thing, then the counterparty can take it immediately. In discrete log contracts, it's the opposite in that if you broadcast the right thing, you will have immediately be able to grab it, right? Because Olivia signs, you now know the full private key for this. You broadcast it, grab the money, you're done. However, if you broadcast the wrong thing, which you can do in this case, right? Let's say there was, you know, it's sunny, and Bob says, whatever, I'm just going to, you know, uh, sorry, Alice says, fine, I know it was sunny, I'm just going to broadcast the rainy transaction. The problem is Alice won't be able to spend that output, and then 100 blocks later, Bob will be able to take it. Right, so it's a little bit switched. In the Lightning, you want to broadcast the one where you have to wait a while. Uh, but in, in discrete log contract, you broadcast the one where you can immediately grab it. And if you broadcast the wrong thing, if you violate the you know, terms of the contract, uh, you won't be able to spend it at all. So there's no point in doing this. Uh, but your counterparty can eventually take the money after 100 blocks. So it's in, in some way much safer in that timing is much more relaxed in discrete log contracts. There's no way to fraudulently steal money unless you broadcast the wrong thing and then just wait. And, you know, the other guy does. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, so in Lightning, the pub Y is correct and pub X is fraud. And then DLC, pub Y is fraud, pub X is correct. It's kind of, kind of switched. Um, so yeah, so walking through it, uh, let's say it rains. Olivia signs the message rain. Uh, Olivia's signature is S sub rain, which is a partial private key. State two is now the correct state. Alice or Bob can broadcast state two. Either one of them can do it, uh, and it's a race. So Alice broadcasts, since she's much more enthusiastic about this outcome, and she says, okay, I have the full, pri the full private key for this. I can immediately spend it. And her software will broadcast this and then immediately broadcast that, right, at the same time. There's no delay. She can make the transaction send. So this just sends to Alice, like normal Alice. Um, in L yeah, so like I was saying, in LN, you always need to watch. In DLC, you don't need to watch. Uh, you can sweep the amount as soon as you want. Uh, and there's no harm in waiting. If you go offline for a week, no big deal. There's no way the uh, there's no way the counterparty can cr wrongly claim funds, um, so that's kind of nicer. Uh, so what happens if Olivia is evil? Well, a bad oracle can cause contracts to execute the wrong way, right? Olivia can say it's sunny when it's rainy, um, but they have to make all the contracts execute the wrong way. She can't say it's sunny to some people and rainy to other people because then she reveals her private key, and then it's just like. Basically, the miners get all the money because you can sign anything and all these transactions are valid. Um, yeah, incorrect signature is public. And also, it helps that Olivia has no idea these contracts are even happening. She probably has some idea since she's reporting these things that, hey, I'm, you know, I'm signing and people might be using this, but she doesn't know who. Uh, yeah. In that... She's signing publicly, right? Olivia doesn't even know who Alice and Bob are, so Olivia's sort of putting this on a website somewhere and saying, okay, here's today's weather. Uh, and so that's public. Everyone can see, like, she signed rain. She did, you know, she signed rain, but it was sunny. Um, so that she can't directly go to uh, Alice and Bob. Oh, so when you say incorrect signature is public, you don't mean, like, signing the thing makes it public. You mean yeah, all, yes, yeah. Public. Yeah, all the signatures are public. So an incorrect signature, everyone will see and immediately know, okay, don't trust Olivia. She signs crazy stuff. So is the fact that she can't sign both the sun and rain just everybody's going to see that she has no integrity and stop using her? Yeah.
Yeah, basically. No, but yeah, so that that's the problem where it's just like the software itself can't tell, but the humans can. Um, and, and yeah, it'd be better if there were some other way, but this seems pretty good in that, well, they only get one chance to do it wrong and they have to do it wrong publicly and they can't equivocate, you know, they can't do it wrong for some subset of contracts and not others. So they, you still need to trust Olivia though, right? Um, but, but also I think it helps that Olivia doesn't need to know about who's doing these contracts. Um, okay. So the whole process, three transactions where you fund it, you close it, and then you have to sweep. Um, but if the parties are cool with each other, they can reduce it to two tra two transactions. What's right. the article's Oracle's motivation for doing work? There's no work. I mean, it's really easy. You just sort of sign, hey, today was sunny, right? right. You got a motivator to take action. Yeah, there's no motivation. <laughs> so, so, you know, Bloomberg, you could pay them out of band or something, but you you know, you need some reliable data feed. Where but if you have if you pay them directly for each contract you're using, then they have visibility into your contracts. Um, I don't think in practice it's a huge problem in that, like, how hard is it is, like, if you're reporting on the price of a stock, well, publicly available data like that, a lot of times, you know, the SEC will do it or Bloomberg or Thomson Reuters or things like that, and they are publicly available. Maybe they can charge for, like, early access and timing and stuff like that, um, but everyone can sort of use it. Yeah, oh, I, so you can aggregate uh, oracles as well. I can show that. Okay, so yeah, scalability-wise, um, you can reduce it to two transactions. If instead of, you know, so instead of funding it and then closing it this way and then sweeping the funds so that Bob can't get it later, uh, you could make a GG transaction instead where you just connect, Alice connects to Bob and says, hey, look, uh, you know you're getting one and I'm getting nine. And if Bob's nice, he'll be like, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll save you some space and, you know, GG. Uh, it, you know, it's nice to do and you don't have to, but you, good game. It's used in video games to, to concede the game before it's like they've completely killed you. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you can't, right? Olivia might know about the contract because maybe Alice tells her or maybe Bob tells her. Um, and so you can still do a, a bribe scenario where Alice, you know, Alice connects to Olivia and say, look, sign that it was, uh, you know, or Bob connects and say, hey, sign that it was sunny. And Olivia's like, if I sign that it was sunny, everyone's going to see this, right? Because this is a public signature. I can't just help you out, right? I have to show everyone. And Bob, but if, if Olivia is sketchy and, and in the, you know, Five coins that Bob will, that Alice will pay her is enough. They can still do that. Yeah. 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 If you already know Alice and Bob's public key that they're using in this, you can subtract out and see that that it was yours. Yeah. But just don't ever tell people. You know, use use different keys every single transaction. Even within this, you'll have different keys for each. Um, and so if, if they're not already known, you won't be able to see it. Uh, but yeah, if you if you keep using the same pub key, then, then Olivia will be really obvious. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, oh, wait. that I'll, I'll do that. There's the slide of that later. Um, another thing you can do for better scalability, which would be really fun, is you make a discrete log contract output from a Lightning Network channel. So then in this case, if you cooperate, and do the GG kind of thing, then nothing gets onto the blockchain throughout the whole process. So let's say you've got a, a Lightning Network channel, and the current balance is like Alice has 35, Bob has or 15. And now you change it, right? So I, both parties have five coins less than they did, fewer. Uh, and now we have this contract output, which is 10 Bitcoins. And then from this output, we can build the DLC contract. And then if we... If someone goes offline or if, you know, parties are uncooperative, okay, first we close out the channel by broadcasting this transaction. Then we close out the contract by broadcasting this kind of transaction. Then I sweep the funds by broadcasting another transaction, which is kind of annoying, um, but still doable. And yeah, like that. However, if we cooperate, um, probably Alice will tell Bob, hey, look, I got nine more coins. Let's just update our balances here and clear out this output 
because you know it's you know the nine are mine and the one's yours, right? You know that the only transaction feasible here is this one. So this is the only thing we have. Let's just add it up like that. And now you I have 39, you have 11, and Bob says, yeah, okay, fine. I want to keep this channel open, and I want to keep you know betting on different things and doing different contracts with you. So sure, and then we clear it out. Um, and then nothing needs to touch the blockchain at all as long as they're cooperating. So that's kind of cool. And you could have multiple, you know, you could have like a whole bunch of different contract outputs coming, you know, descending from your channel uh, transaction output. And then you like take them out, put them in, things like that. Uh, so that'd be kind of cool. Discrete are the contracts. Yeah, so so they're, no one can see them even when they're broadcast. Uh, they look a lot, they look the same as the Lightning Network, the same scripts and just pub keys. Uh, the Oracle's pub key is not detectable um, or decidable. You know, you can't even prove that you had it in there. Okay, uh, wait, so, okay, mm, got to go quick. Uh, yeah, three is kind of fun, but what if you want a whole bunch? You can make thousands of transactions. So, like, based out, you know, Olivia will sign, okay, I'm going to sign the price of a dollar in Satoshi's. And you can make a bajillion different, 100,000 different transactions and you know, sign them all, send all those signatures, and then one of them will be valid, and then you can broadcast that one, and you can have very high granularity. Um, you can split the R value that the, so you could, so one way to do it is I'm gonna sign every digit of the price, or I'm gonna sign, you know, the binary decomposition of the price, which with a different signature and a different R value for each uh, binary digit, or make like an exponent and mantissa kind of setup, so it's sort of floating point where, if there's cases where, if the price, you know, let's say we're betting on the price of uh, a dollar. The, the thing is, it's much better to think of it as like the dollar is an altcoin or like everything, everything's in Bitcoin terms. Um, rather than I want to I want to bet on the price of Bitcoin because like Bitcoin's all there is in this system. So you're betting on the price of a dollar. Um, and you could say, well, if the dollar goes below like, you know, a thousand Satoshis, Alice just gets all the money. And if the dollar goes above like a million Satoshis, Bob gets all the money or something. Uh, so there's like in large ranges where the same, the same transaction, giving the same balances, uh, suffices for a large range of, uh, of signatures. And so if you chop up the signatures into like multiple things like an exponent and mantissa, then you can have fewer transactions and cut, cut down the waste uh, a lot. So that, that helps. Uh, it's not a huge deal in that like, yeah, you could still make a couple gigabytes of transactions since it's all off chain, but it makes it a lot faster. Uh, you can also do multi-Oracle. So uh, you can just say, look, we're gonna use both Oracle A and Oracle B, and we're gonna combine them just by adding the points up, and now that's the combined Oracle point, where if they both sign the same thing, it'll work. Um, it's N of N, so there's no sign size increase. If you want to sign like two of three Oracles, then you get a size blow up. But if you're saying, look, we're just using these two oracles or these three oracles, and they should all sign the same thing and agree, no size difference. Uh, they have to agree exactly, though, right? If one person says, oh, it's, you know, the price is 1,074 Satoshis, and the other person says the price is 1,075 Satoshis, you're stuck, right? Now nothing works. And so you can have some kind of, like, timeout transaction where if, if the or, or if the oracle goes offline or something wrong happens, both parties get their money back at the end, and it's sort of a wash trade. Uh, Novation would be really fun. Looks kind of complicated to code. So let's say Alice is in a discrete log contract with Bob and the contract ends next week and it's a contract for dollars or stocks or something. And Alice wants out now because she's up or maybe she's down. Uh, if Bob is offline, we're stuck. But if Bob is online, you have some options. Bob, Alice can say, hey Bob, I want to take profit or stop losses. You know, I want to end this contract. And Bob can say, sure, I'm out too. Let's just, you know, close it out. Let's make a GG transaction at whatever the current price seems to be, and I'll, I'll you know, go on. The problem is this is interactive and unlikely because it's not just interactive for the two computers, like Bob has to actually choose at the same time, right? Alice has to say, oh cool, I'm up 10%, I want out. And Bob has to agree and say, yeah, I wanna lock in my losses. I think it's gonna keep going up and I want out. That seems unlikely. Um, better would be, hey Bob, I changed my pub key. And then Bob's like, yeah, okay, whatever. What's really happening is that Alice found a third party, Carol, to take her place within this contract, right? Alice is saying, look, I'm in this contract. It's up 10%. I think it's gonna still keep going up. Actually, I don't, that's why I'm trying to get out. But hey, Carol, you should take my place here. Like you should take my place in this contract. 
um, with Bob. And then you need to, you know, this is interactive in the computer sense, in that all three computers need to send each other messages. But it's not in the human sense, in that Bob's computer can just automatically sign off on these things, right? Because Bob, from Bob's perspective, well, the only thing changing in my contract is my counterparty's public keys, right? I still get the exact same payout based on the or same Oracle signature. Um, so yeah, Alice and Bob can build a new contract with Carol's keys as the payout, and then Alice hands all those things over to Carol, who then signs and puts her money in or gets money out, depending. Uh, so all three need to sign. It's a little complex, but it could be mostly automated. Yeah. Yeah, if you can't find a Carol, then you're stuck, right? If you can't find another counterparty, Bob's in the contract. You, you can't back out of the contract. Um, but and, and if Bob d disagrees, right, if Bob says, no, I, I'm staying, or just Bob unplugs his Ethernet cable, then you're stuck, right? But if Bob is being nice and he's online and he says, yeah, like, I'll let you get out of my contract. It's no skin off my back because I'm still in the same contract just with someone else. Sure. And then maybe Alice can give him like a couple Satoshis uh, as part of the process. Yeah, so your software, you know, you just set it on your software. Look, if someone wants to novate, if someone wants to swap contracts around, I'm fine with that. I'll leave my computer on and I won't do it for free though. You got to give me a thousand Satoshis. And then you just let your computer run and people start trading around with you and then you're out. So that'd be cool. That's a lot of coding. I That's going to be later. Um, so yeah, some use cases. I don't know, like weather? Probably not. Currency futures? Probably. I would think that that's one of the big, you know, people like dollars for some reason. Um, I don't know why, because it keeps going down in value. But um, some people want dollars instead of Bitcoins. But they like the, uh, the ability of Bitcoins to send around anonymously and on the internet and stuff like that. Uh, so I think one of the big ones would be, okay, you have futures contracts for dollars uh, settled in Bitcoin. And all you need is the price of a dollar, you know, an oracle to sign off on the price. Like an exchange could do that. Um, stocks would be fun. People can have, you know, I got a future for, you know, one share of Google stock denominated in Bitcoin. Commodities might be fun. People can buy and sell things. Sports, gambling, insurance. Insurance is also gambling. You're just like, hey, I bet I'm going to crash my car. And the insurance says, I bet you won't. <laughs> and if you crash your car, you win and they have to pay you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the problem. You already crashed your car, and you, yeah, so it's it's not a great gamble. It's great for them though. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty general system where you can basically make conditional payments based on any number or element from some predetermined set. Uh, it's not fully like you can't say, hey, let's bet on what the the title of the highest grossing movie summer 2018. You might be able to do that because you can kind of think what they're going to be, and the oracle says, look, I'm just going to sign the title of the highest grossing you know Hollywood movie next year. Uh, but what if it's a name that you didn't even anticipate, right? So you need to sort of anticipate all the possible outcomes. And you have to enumerate everything that could happen. So that's a little heavy. And for some things that once you get like multidimensional, it can get really big and ugly. Like, hey, let's use these two different oracles. Uh, and then it's like the square of the number of transactions. So yeah, so it's kind of cool. Uh, no token needed. You just use Bitcoins. No ICO. Yeah, so OK. Uh, cool. OK. <laughs> So I managed to fill two hours and 40 minutes. So you're up next, I guess. Cool. OK, so yeah, I'm around if you have. I'm, I went really fast through that last one because I didn't realize how long the lit fun would take. So if you have questions about it, come ask me. And I'm basically giving this talk, but like stripped down tomorrow. So cool. Thanks.